this video, I will discuss Agile estimation and key points to look out for. Hello, my name is Neil Potter, and I help Agile teams go beyond the basics of Agile software development. Please click below to subscribe for future videos. Customers and managers rely on deadlines to run their operations, and the deadlines for software delivery are driven by estimates. In this video, I will describe some key points to look out for when creating estimates and schedules. So there are three things we're gonna look at. One is story points and the backlog. One is effort estimation, and one is schedule estimation. So the first thing we do in Agile estimation is to come up with a backlog, a backlog like this, and then come up with these uh, story point estimations for every item in the backlog. And the purpose is to get a rough idea of the magnitude or size of that item or complexity. So we know how, roughly how much work will be involved in doing that. Now the system we're using here is basically a relative scale uh, where 20 means a half of the amount of work within a 40 and 8 is roughly you know, a third of that again, a third of 20. And so the idea is that if you have a scale like this, you can get a rough picture of very big things and very small things and that can feed into your effort estimate later on. Now, very commonly in Agile, uh, people are going to use the Fibonacci series. Uh, Fibonacci series is basically a number sequence uh, put together in the 12th century uh, by an Italian mathematician called Mr. Fibonacci. And basically back then they were modeling, or he was modeling uh, bunny rabbit growth in the, that part of the world. As bunny rabbits multiply, uh, to get a feel for how many bunny rabbits there would be, uh, they basically bu built a sequence like this uh, to predict that. Uh, at no point was Mr. Fibonacci thinking about agile software development uh, back in the 12th century. So the number sequence is adequate for estimation because it is a big range. It goes from a very small number, 1 to 2 uh, to 40. And actually in the original sequence, of, of course, it goes beyond that point. And we take any two numbers, add them together, and we get the third number or the next number in the sequence. But there's nothing magical about Fibonacci sequence. I think a lot of teams have become a little emotionally attached to the word Fibonacci uh, to make it kind of sound impressive. And when they say we're doing estimation, they mention the Fibonacci sequence as if there's some kind of magical benefit of doing that. If it was the Fred Bloggs sequence or the Bill Smith sequence or the Jane Smith sequence, I think people would be less enamored by the estimation technique. So I think what's important is to pick a sequence or a range. Again, it could be relative and then use the sequence to then figure out uh, small things and big things in the backlog as a point of discussion to figure out what the likely effort and labor will be and cost uh, to build that item uh, later on. Now, some teams don't use Fibonacci. Uh, they use an alternative uh, like t-shirt sizes uh, where they have small, medium, large, and extra large. Again, this is a relative discussion of the magnitude or size of the item on the, uh, the backlog. The downside of a t-shirt size is that you really can't calculate anything with that. Uh, because uh, small doesn't mean either two weeks or four weeks or ten weeks. You have to then recalculate uh, in a number system uh, to derive e effort or labor or schedule. So I think if you are really getting at the beginning of this, and uh, you may use t-shirt size, but I would at least use a number system where you can then calculate velocity and other things with the numbers uh, later on. Um, a lot of teams will use planning poker as their approach for this. Uh, planning poker is a very simple way to discuss the item in the backlog and then everybody kind of throws down their estimate in terms of points and if there's any discrepancy uh, that is a cause for discussion and to clarify the item on the backlog so nothing wrong with that at all it's a good point to going to drive discussion uh, some teams uh, uh, go beyond that and do white band delphi uh, white band delphi is very similar in nature and how you discuss the tasks, the breakdown, the assumptions, and effort and size. So a few more things going on in the discussion and being recorded. So it's just a little bit more than uh, planning poker. You can go to Wikipedia and see why Band Delphi being described uh, quite well up there. And a lot of teams, when they get beyond this point, uh, will use multiple methods. Maybe they're going to use historical data, uh, look at previous projects or previous tasks, 
use estimation for story points and velocity, and maybe do a, a third check uh, of the data uh, using Evert estimates too. So I would not be tied to any one particular approach. Uh, they all work okay, uh, but you want to get a good estimate versus going to just sticking with one approach uh, to do that. So the next step is to derive effort. Uh, effort would mean uh, billable hours or label or uninterrupted effort or ideal time, uh, all the same kind of activity. And the idea of starting with a Fibonacci series or a story point series and then a velocity is you can then take the velocity and figure out the likely duration. So if we had a project or a backlog of a thousand points, add up all the items together, and we knew actually that our team uh, could do 25 points per person per day, then we can then take that number of using an average of a velocity and then come up with a rough idea of person days and then a rough idea of person weeks. So if you have good data for velocity data, like how many points per week a team member or a team can do, uh, then you can do a quick calculation and get a quick a prediction of the likely effort at the end. Now, all systems are garbage in and garbage out. And so if you have poor data or no data for velocity or points, uh, then of course you're not going to get a very good uh, answer at the end. So what I recommend is if you are beginning on the story point journey and you have no good velocity data yet, uh, you simply start with effort estimates uh, in terms of a breakdown of tasks and the likely labor required to do those. And then bit by bit, you're going to build up your velocity numbers by correlating uh, the points complete and the points remaining compared to the effort expended on the project. So eventually you'll then have some very good velocity numbers and you can then refer back to the first approach to take a story point total and then divide by your team's velocity. Now another point about this is that uh, these velocity numbers are not good across teams. They're really reflective of a team's performance, their skill, their particular individuals, how they work together, uh, their level of interruption and the kind of work they're doing. So a team's velocity would not be very shareable or comparable to other teams elsewhere. Unless you had very, very similar teams going uh, doing work and similar kind of work being done across your organization. I would say if you have stable data, uh, use it. Uh, the whole purpose of velocity data and calculations is to speed up estimation uh, because you could then uh, look at a bigger project know your rough average velocity, and then figure out what the likely uh, duration is. If your data varies by maybe 20%, so if you look at your actuals and they are 20% different from what you have predicted, or more than 20%, then maybe keep on calculating or cal uh, tracking the velocity numbers, but actually refer more to your effort estimates as you do your predictions, uh, these ones just here, because your velocity data isn't stable enough yet uh, to use for prediction. It's going to get there eventually, uh, but I would say if it's kind of shaky or very volatile data, uh, then hold off until you kind of use it, maybe after a few more sprints, and then when you get more better averages that are more predictable, uh, then you could use the data. If you have no size data whatsoever, then I would say start off with effort estimates and then track your velocity over time. And maybe after 10 or 15 sprints, you have then very good velocity data and then you could then uh, speed up your estimation uh, using velocity. But at the beginning, uh, your data could be all over the place, very wild, and so not particularly dependable to use on calculating uh, final deadlines. So most teams uh, use historical data uh, eventually when they have velocity data, and uh, when they do that, they can really get a better, uh, quicker estimate because they have more wisdom built into the velocity number, and they can quickly kind of head off major disasters or overcommitment uh, by knowing roughly the likely duration it's going to take uh, based upon their point count and their velocity. So when I said come up with a, a breakdown of effort, maybe if you don't have good velocity numbers, I mean a, a breakdown like this. So here's our user story. Here's our initial estimate of points, uh, maybe 13. And here's our breakdown of tasks, typically called the sprint backlog. Uh, and typically your done definition would be in that list of tasks. Now, when you finish the task list, you will be done uh, with the user story. And this person here is, or the team is, estimating the likely effort required uh, to do that. Now, if you have a very ambiguous backlog and there are many unknowns in the backlog, particularly for the upcoming sprint, 
You might even uh, try a range. Uh, if at the beginning of the project you have many unknowns, features that may or may not be in there, uh, things that are difficult to do or could be easy to do, and you don't know exactly where you stand because there are many variables in the backlog, then what you could do is promise the customer and the big boss a range of estimates from A through B. And the range basically reflects ambiguity or comprehends ambiguity. That is, an ambiguous backlog uh, would lead to an ambiguous range of estimates. And then basically promise that after the first and second sprint uh, here and here, uh, you're going to use the feedback of the sprint and the actual data, the velocity data, and then bit by bit kind of uh, refine your range. So maybe after sprint number one, and you build a set of set of features, you get feedback on the features, you look at the time spent doing that. Maybe you can then promise maybe C through D. So your range started out with A through B uh, because there are many variables unknown at that point. And the feedback loops of sprint number one, number two, uh, basically give you feedback that enables you to refine the estimates and the features and the definition of the backlog. And maybe your second or third sprint, you then promise C through D. Now, most customers and big bosses, what they don't want to do is be surprised by you exceeding B. So you want to give B as the worst case situation where you don't kind of surprise them and exceed it. So if you give a best case A and a worst case B as the range, and then basically promise that after the first one or two sprints, you will then refine that range inwards uh, from that point. And then the step three of this is to come up with the schedule. Now, of course, the final duration is based upon many factors, uh, partly the number of people you have assigned to the particular task or that part of the project, and partly their availability uh, based upon them sharing their work with other projects or them being out at other meetings and other events they have to take care of. So given the number of people, how they can work in parallel for that particular task, and how much they are then interrupted elsewhere by other things, you can then figure out a likely duration. And this calculation here gives you a rough, rough idea of what can be done in a particular sprint. And then we can look at dependencies uh, that go across the sprint. Maybe every sprint is a month in this case, and the team delivers a thing to the customer for feedback or to testing for feedback at the end of the sprint. But the final release cannot be done until the very end because uh, there are many features required uh, to be done by that point. So the overall schedule would then be based upon the resources, their availability, and the dependencies in the schedule. And any dependencies to the outside world, maybe there's a delivery coming from externally, like a piece of hardware or software, and you have to then arrange your schedule to kind of comprehend that. So there are many things going on here to really figure out final schedule. It's more than just coming up with a story point and a velocity number. Good teams will learn these skills and do them extremely well within an agile environment. Uh, teams at the very beginning may kind of be thinking that just a point count and a velocity will be adequate, but there are many other factors that go into the, the accuracy of the final schedule. Now, of course, there's more to scheduling than meets the eye, and there's more to scheduling uh, that you would typically find in a regular agile course. In fact, one of the reasons I put this, this series together is to go beyond agile basics. We have risk management. So you definitely want to learn and apply risk management. Uh, this is a way to look at uh, things that could go wrong, uh, dependencies, resources, people, communication, etc. Uh, mitigate that. There are ways to modify the schedule to comprehend risk. Uh, resource leveling. This is where you look at the detailed resource assignments or resource grabbing of a project as they grab tasks off the, back, off the backlog and making sure that the labor allocated to them on the task is evenly distributed. So you don't have one person working 100 hours a week and two people working 20 hours a week uh, that you then figure out how to level those resources so you can bring the schedule back in and not burn people out. And critical path where there are basically no gaps between the tasks and they are end-to-end, -end, any one task moves, it bumps another task out. And where there could be major gaps between the tasks where a task is waiting quite a while for something else they're going to get done before they can kind of start. So uh, the whole analysis of the gaps and closing those gaps out or managing those gaps is called critical path analysis. Uh, not too difficult to do, uh, but a way again to optimize the schedule and bring the final deadline back in. 
in summary, care needs to be taken when developing estimates uh, because there are many people that are dependent upon your deliverables and they are based upon your estimates and the schedules you put together behind the scenes. Thanks for watching the video. For more help on these topics and your Agile implementation, please see the links below.